Powerful. <laughs> All right, so we could just we turn this down just a little bit if you could there, Tim, so I don't scare myself. All right, let's go ahead and we'll in prayer, everybody. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. I do thank you, Lord, that we can take a look at your word again. Uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, we can uh, have this nice, this beautiful building in which to worship. We have heat. We have, uh, we have covering from rain. Uh, we have freedom, Lord. Thank you so much for those blessings. We don't want to take them for granted. Lord, I also pray for, I, I pray for uh, Bill Dunn, that you'd be with him, Lord, as he is healing from that hip surgery. I pray that you'd help him, Lord, to recover and hopefully get back on his feet soon, literally. And also for Dean, that you'd be with him and the health issues that he is going through. And pray that you give him the stamina and the fortitude and also the, the grace to, uh, to go through that. Thank you for our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So last week, we took a look at 2 Kings. We uh, focused the first few chapters, the first nine chapters actually, are focused on Elijah and Elisha. Um, we talked about the fact that Elijah did probably six to ten miracles, depending on how you want to phrase a miracle, uh, and that Elisha did twice as many. He did basically twice as many. Plus, we saw that Elijah only ministered for about 25 years or so, and Elisha ministered for 52 years. So when he asked that the Lord would give him a double portion of the Spirit, he literally did, and that's exactly what happened. We also talked about the tumultuous years in Israel and Judah, the divided kingdom. We talked about the fact that um, Judah had eight good kings, relatively speaking, and it had 12 kings that were less than good. How many good kings did the nation of Israel have? Do you remember? Zero. <laughs> exactly right. All 19 were really bad. Now, if you were quote-unquote good in Israel, it meant that you just worshipped the calves that Jeroboam made. And if you were bad, you worshipped them and Baal and, and Moloch and all the other gods. So it was all a degree of good or, ba or bad, I should say. We talked about Israel going into captivity in 722, and we see that uh, Judah itself went into captivity in 586 B.C., and does anyone remember the name of Judah's most infamous king? Manasseh. <clears throat> Manasseh was the one. And unfortunately, he had a really long reign. He undid everything good that Hezekiah, his father, had done. Hezekiah was an exceptionally good king. He's one of the two that are mentioned as having a heart like his father, David. Um, and, and Manasseh took that and he inverted it completely. He wound up uh, worshiping every idol under the sun. He wound up killing his children, sacrificing them to idols. It says that he shed so much innocent blood that God was unwilling to forgive. And so the deportation occurred in large part because of Manasseh and because of the wickedness that he uh, engendered. So today we're going to look at First Chronicles as we I feel like I'm skipping rocks on the surface of the water, right? We're skipping rocks as we're going through these books of the Bible. Today we're going to skip a rock through 1 Chronicles. Now, 1 and 2 Chronicles, as you'll see from your notes, covers the same history as 2 Samuel through 2 Kings. This is kind of a repeat, as it were. 1 Chronicles focuses on Judah and the Davidic dynasty. Very little is written in 1 or 2 Chronicles about uh, the kingdom of Israel. It could be considered a divine editorial on the history of Judah. Now, First and Second Chronicles were originally one book, as were First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel. So they divided them up into two books, and like the other two, it divided it up in the Septuagint that was written about 300 or so B.C. Translated, I should say. In Jerome's Latin Vulgate, it's given the title Chronicles of Sacred History, from which we basically called it, shortened it to Chronicles. The author, again, like Kings and like um, Samuel, we don't know for sure. But we think, we think it was Ezra. Chronicles has a definite priestly focus, and Ezra, of course, was a priest. Also, there's many similarities in writing style with Ezra. And also in 2 Maccabees, it's mentioned that Nehemiah had an extensive library from which Ezra would have been able to access to help write his history, and so if he chose to do so. 
The date and setting, uh, the setting is in Judah. Now, if you look at the chronolo- or genealogies, the date begins at day one and goes all the way to about 430 B.C. But that's just if you look at the genealogies. The fact is that this deals primarily with the reign of David, which is about a 40-year period. But with the, uh, with the uh, genealogies, we see that we have Adam all the way through Zerubbabel's grandchildren. And that's about, we see Ezra arriving in Jerusalem about 457 B.C. or so. <clears throat> Theme and purpose is to provide a spiritual perspective on the historical events from the time of David to Solomon's rise as king. First and Second Chronicles, it's believed, has been written to give encouragement to the people of Israel who've returned after the exile. They no longer have a king. They're under Gentile dominion, and they've been under Gentile dominion for the entire history of their existence until 1948 when they became a nation. But even then, they're still under a lot of Gentile uh, pressure, if nothing else. Even right now, they're trying to uh, root out Hamas. In the meantime, you have the whole world putting pressure on them to stop, to stop their attacks. So even though Israel's not being ruled by Gentiles now, there's still a, a lot of pressures put on them from the Gentile people. But First Chronicles and Second is written to show them that, that God is still with them, that God is going to have a purpose in them, and he does. Christ is seen in David and his dynasty, in the certainty of fulfillment of God's promises. And the book of Chronicles is actually the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew Bible is arranged a little bit differently than ours. We have Chronicles as the last book, whereas we have Malachi. The outline, we have, I divided up into four parts. The first part is the genealogies. The second part deals with David's direct reign. The third part deals with the organization of the kingdom and its worship. And then finally, the last two chapters deal with David's final preparation for the temple. So, let's talk about the first section, which is genealogies. Now, genealogies are important. I'm going to start with non-Jewish cultures. Why would genealogies be important in some non-Jewish cultures? Go ahead. Who has control of land, property, and money? Okay, good. Other ideas? Genealogies. How important are they to us in the United States? No, not really important, right? I mean, most people that have genealogies do it as kind of a hobby. More, more than you want to find if there's if Jesse James is in your lineage, right? Somebody, somebody notorious. But otherwise, genealogies doesn't really mean a whole lot to us in this country. But in many countries, it means a great deal. For example, in India, it means a lot because you'll find out what caste you belong to. Now, they've tried to take that apart over the last few centuries, but it hasn't worked. They still have that caste thing. So if, you are, if your genealogy says you're in, for example, the untouchable class, that's where you're staying. Whatever class you're in, that's where you're going to be. Uh, Japan is kind of the same way. It's not as, as uh, bleak as it is with, with uh, Hinduism, but you still have like the warrior class, the merchant class, etc., and you're kind of expected to stay in that group. So like I said, the United States is very unique in that people come over here and no one cares, for the most part, who your father, well, if he's really bad, they may care, but no one cares who your family is. You can come to the United States and make an entirely new identity for yourself. And so many people have done just that. However, is it important in Jewish culture, and if so, why? Is genealogy important in the Jewish culture? And if so, why? Bill. Good. 
So just to reemphasize, I know it's kind of hard to hear sometimes, but so it's important because you need to know who's of the tribe of David, whether they can be king or not. Uh, with Levi, remember, you're, if you're uh, going to be a priest, you better be from the tribe of Levi. And it's even more specific than that, which we'll talk about in just a bit. And even which tribe you belong to, and that's where your home will be basically situated in. So it meant a great deal in Judaism. Now, there is a dearth of genealogical records in recent days, in the past centuries. Few people know, with the, well, I, can't, I shouldn't say that, the, the class who are the priests, we believe they have the last name of Cohen, which means literally priest. So if you're Jewish and you have the last name of Cohen, chances are very good that you're from the tribe of Levi, right? But otherwise, you can know that you're Jewish, perhaps from your name, but you don't know exactly where you're from or where you fit in. Now, there is a new technology that's come out that's going to probably revolutionize that. Now, what would that technology be? DNA. That's right. With DNA, we can tell if you even have a smidgen of whatever nationality that you, you know, is a part of your DNA. So, so I'm guessing, speculation, that during the building of the last temple, um, you know, I think they're going to select people that are going to be priests. I'm willing to bet they're going to use DNA to verify that you really are from the priestly class in order to offer the sacrifices that will be offered during the tribulation period when the temple is being used. So that should take the spot, hopefully, of the dearth of genealogy. So let's take a look at chapter 1 of First Chronicles. And we'll start looking at some different, different verses to kind of get the flow of the book. <clears throat> First Chronicles chapter 1, we see we have in the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, we have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamach, etc. We have the uh, beginning from Adam to Abraham's descendants. So if you continue on, you'll see down a little bit further, we have Abraham's descendants. Now, the rest of the chapter 1 deals with either Abraham's descendants directly, like Ishmael, Ishmael's children, and also with the children that Abraham had with Keturah, because he had several other children that branched out and into the Middle East. So this chapter deals with them. It also deals with the children of Esau and his descendants. So that's what chapter 1 kind of focuses on, kind of like the non-Jewish part of Abraham's descendants. Chapters 2 through 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, we see, These are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These three were born to him by Bethshua the Canaanitess. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so he put him to death. So we have, this focuses on David's family, as well as chapter 3, chapters 2 and 3 through Zerubbabel's grandchildren. So at the end of chapter 3, you had the grandchildren of Zerubbabel, who was a descendant of David. He's part of the Messianic line. In chapters, chapters 4 and 5, we have, I'm just going to call those various genealogies of other tribes of Israel, the other, the other tribes. Chapter 6 then focuses on the Levites, and you see chapter 6 and following is pretty, pretty extensive. So it's very important, especially the lineage, to be the priests and high priests. So chapter 6, verse 1, the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Kohath were Amran, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. The children of Amran were Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. And the sons of Aaron were Nadab, Abahu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. So as it turns out, um, if you are going to be one, either a priest or a high priest who's going to offer sacrifices and offer incense, you're going to be from the tribe of Kohath. Well, Levi, through him, you have Kohath. Through Kohath, you have Aaron. And then you have Aaron's sons, his two sons that are surviving. So if you're going to be a high priest, you have to be a part of that lineage. Now, the other priests can help. You know, the other Levites are considered priests. Well, they're from the priestly tribe, but they can't offer the sacrifices and the incense, but they can support those who are doing it. So you had to be from that particular 
group through Aaron in order to be a high priest. I also wanted to take a look here at, we have three worship team leaders mentioned in chapter 6. So we have in chapter 6, verse 31, <clears throat> Now these are those whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord, after the ark rested there. They ministered with song before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they served in their office according to the order. These are those who serve with their sons. From the, from the sons of the Kohathites were Heman, the singer, the son of Joel, the son of Samuel, etc. So He-Man, or yeah, He-Man, right? Now, you think of a real, you think of a real manly man with He-Man, right? I'm sure it meant, didn't mean that in Hebrew, but that's what we think about. But He-Man was a, one of the worship team leaders that led in worship for, for David. And it says in verse 32, according to their order. So you had a rotation going on here between He-Man and the other two worship team leaders, of which we have in verse 39. He-Man's brother Asaph stood at his right hand, even Asaph, the son of Berechiah, the son of Shemaiah. So He-Man's brother Asaph was also one of the worship team leaders. Now, it's, it turns out that he's not really He-Man's brother. So what do I mean by that? Well, He-Man he is from the tribe of Kohath, and we have Asaph, he's from the tribe of Gershom. So he is not his brother, but I'm guessing they're using the same phraseology that we use, you know, Brother Steve or Brother Dave, that kind of thing, because they were close. They must have been close because they're referred to as this. So you had He-Man, you had Asaph, and one more person in verse 44, another worship team leader. On the left hand were their kinsmen, the sons of Merari, Ethan, the son of Kishi, the son of Abdi, the son of Maluk. So you had Ethan, who also was a worship team leader. So at this time, you have Heman, you have uh, Asaph, and you have Ethan. I think Ethan was the one, if I remember right, who came out with the idea of wearing skinny jeans when you are a worship team leader. I have tea. I wish, I wish Joseph was here. I, I've teased him in the past. And I, you know, Joseph, I mean, worship team leader is supposed to wear skinny jeans, you know. And I'd, I'd poke fun of Jess if she were here. Well, Jess says no, you know. <laughs> anyway, we have fun. I, I, I was much fun teasing Joseph as I do my own kids. Um, so each also was used to write scripture. As it turns out, uh, He-Man wrote Psalm 88. Asaph wrote Psalms 50 and Psalms 73 to 83, and Ethan wrote Psalm 89. So in chapter 25, these three worship team leaders are referred to as prophets, and they are. I mean, they probably were prophets that prophesied, but also they actually wrote scripture. So it wasn't just worship team leading, it was more than that. They were really heavily involved in the word of God. So one point I was going to make is that worship team leaders are of great importance. What, what requirements does a worship team leader have to have? Mark? Okay. Know the scripture, know the words that you're proposing for worship. What else? Isn't there a special verse like in First Hezekiah about worship team leader? <laughs> no, I mean there isn't. There isn't a category per se. However, oh, go ahead, Peggy. Oh, you definitely do. You do. What I was going to infer was, even though it's not listed, what can we determine would be the requirement of a worship team leader? Uh, Peggy definitely is right, a heart for God. What else? At the very least, you should meet what requirement? What's that? Well, that too. <laughs> but I'm up there. Be a believer, yeah. And I was thinking at least the requirements of a deacon. You know, at least. I, you know, an elder, one of the things they are able to do is, or are supposed to do is teach. So that's a, one of the major differences between an elder and a deacon. So, not that the worship team leader is expected to teach, although he probably will, but at least the requirements of a deacon, because you're standing in front of these people, and, you know, you need to be somebody that they can look up to, 
and, and, and also, as Peggy mentioned, a heart for people, definitely uh, musically inclined to a certain degree. Carry a tune in a bucket or something like that. <laughs> Steve? Oh. Good. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I guess we are. If nothing, if if nothing else, by example. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, so the characteristics of a good worship team leader would include, obviously, musically inclined. You meet the standards of at least a deacon to do that. Anything else? Any other characteristics? Another characteristic I think about is is a heart for people. You know, I've I've talked with Jos. I said, Jos, you have a pastor's heart. He does. He cares for people. He cares for us. He cares for you guys. He cares about music, but he cares about music not only that it's done well, but also um, that it's accurate. You know, he, we talk about that. He talks with the elders occasionally to make sure that the music that we sing is, it accurately reflects God's glory, is true to his word, etc. We don't, we don't want to be singing things uh, that are inaccurate or are wrong. And I also want to mention Matthew, since he's here. I can't embarrass Joe, so I've got to embarrass Matthew. Matthew's another one who meets these requirements. He is, he is a, he's a person who cares for people. He loves music. He does a great job up here. We're blessed in this church. We have a great couple of worship team leaders. Uh, it's a big deal. It was a big deal for David. It's a big deal for us too. Here, Teresa. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. It should be a calling from God. Good, good. Right. You know, another thing too, there a lot, there's a lot of friction in churches and a lot of difficulty sometimes because of music, because of worship team leaders versus the, uh, the um, um, you know, the administrative staff and back and forth. Um, so music can be very, a very challenging thing. I'm thankful that here we don't seem to have that. I'm grateful for that. Uh, music can also cause somebody to become kind of egocentric, especially if you're really good. We've got a couple of really good, really good people up there who do a great job. And it would be easy to become prideful, you know, but um, that's something we always have to keep under wraps as well to remember who put us there and who we owe everything to. Go ahead, Linda. Right, yeah, somebody's more concerned about being stylish than prayerful. That's one thing I'm also grateful about is, uh, is Joe and Matthew, we always start with prayer, whether it's practice or the real deal. So we want it to be honoring to God in everything. Okay, so let's move on to David's reign, chapter 11. You can feel free to tell Joe I mentioned him in the class. <laughs> All positive stuff, of course. All right, David's reign, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Then all Israel gathered to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past, even when Saul was king, and you were the one who led out and brought in Israel, and the Lord your God said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall be prince over my people Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord through Samuel. So David is made king over all Israel here. Now he's been king for two years already over Judah. And what happened was there was a civil war between David's, David's army and the house of Saul. 
And then after two years, uh, somebody assassinated that king, and the Jews or the uh, Israelites came down to David and Hebron, and they wanted him to have a united kingdom, which he did. Continuing in chapter 11, verse 4, Then David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is, Jebus, and the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were there. The inhabitants of Jebus said to David, You shall not enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David had said, Whoever strikes down a Jebusite first shall be chief and commander. Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first, and so he became chief. So we see that Jerusalem is conquered. So after seven years, Jerusalem itself was conquered, and David changed his, um, changed his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. He mentioned uh, Joab was the one who masterminded the conquering of Jerusalem, and because of that, he became the commander of the armies. Now, interestingly, Joab was a cousin of David. His mother and David's mother were sisters. So you see how there's a little bit of a family thing going on here, which is fine. Uh, Joab was, was very much a bloodthirsty person. He definitely was very effective at what he did, but he was also fairly treacherous, as many of you know from the history. Turning over to chapter 15, we continue with David as he's ruling in Jerusalem. He, he has it in his heart to bring the ark of the Lord into Jerusalem. Chapter 15 and verse 11. <clears throat> then David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, and said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' households of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord of Israel to the place I've prepared for it. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. So we see the ark is brought into Jerusalem. Now verse 13, I kind of look at it, it seems to imply a rebuke. Remember, how did David try to bring the ark into Jerusalem the first time? Peggy? On a cart, cart, right. And we asked ourselves, well, why did he do that? Well, the Philistines had sent it back on a cart, so maybe, oh, well, we'll just use a cart as well. And it cost Uzzah Uzzah his death, his, his life. He had to reach out and grab it so it didn't fall off the cart. And so the impression I have, it's just an impression, is that the Levites didn't go, well, we, we should be carrying that. And they apparently went along with it. And this time David's saying, now, you folks are supposed to carry it. As it says, you're supposed to do it. So I kind of take that as a bit of a rebuke. Chapter 16, verse 1, And they brought in the ark of God and placed it inside the tent, which David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. While he was bringing this ark in, there was an incredible celebration. You had all three of the worship team leaders present, it says in the previous chapter. So they were all involved. Uh, There's a great amount of music. It mentions David dancing before the Lord with all his might. It was a really, really big deal bringing the ark in. Um, so they put the ark underneath a tent of its own, but you still had the rest of the tabernacle in Gibeon, which was some distance away. So you had, you had the tabernacle in Gibeon where they still offered sacrifices, and then you had the ark itself that was in Jerusalem under a tent. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see probably next week that Solomon goes to Gibeon where he offers all these sacrifices, and that's where the Lord appears to him before the temple is built. The, the next few chapters, after 15 and 16, discuss God's covenant with David because David wanted to build a house of the Lord, um, but, but God said, no, but I'll build one for you, David. We have the war with the Ammonites. We have the census and the plague that resulted in the purchase of the threshing floor, which will become the site of Solomon's temple. The Bathsheba episode, which we talked about last week, isn't mentioned here. Uh, it's not mentioned in First Chronicles. So, for some reason, they just don't mention that. I think they're focusing on the positive aspects of it, as it were. So that consists of basically David's reign. So let's talk about from there to the organization of the kingdom and its worship. We see that the, the um, 
kingdom of David was very highly organized. You take a look at the next, starting at chapter, <clears throat> chapter 23, that it, it is just highly organized. So um, chapter 23, verse 3. <clears throat> the Levites were, were numbered from 30 years old and upward, and their number by census of men was 38,000. Of these, 24,000 were to oversee the work of the house of the Lord, and 6,000 were officers and judges, 4,000 were gatekeepers, 4,000 were praising the Lord with the instruments which David made for giving praise. David divided them into divisions according to the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. So we see that these people, the Levites here, are going to oversee the construction of the temple, and they're also going to oversee worship and etc. after the temple is constructed, even to the part about gatekeepers and other things that they're going to need uh, to do. Again, chapter 23, verse 12. <clears throat> the sons of Kohath were four, Amran, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. The sons of Amran were Aaron and Moses. And Aaron was set apart to sanctify him as most holy, he and the sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless his name forever. So we see that the priesthood again was to go from Kohath to Aaron. You had to be part of that lineage if you're going to offer sacrifices and if you're going to be offering incense inside the, uh, the tabernacle. In chapter 24, verse 1, now the divisions of the sons of Aaron were these. The sons of Aaron were Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Okay, we got that. And um, verse 5, thus they were divided by lot, the one as the other, for they were officers of the sanctuary and officers of God, both from the descendants of Eleazar and the descendants of Ithamar. Um, and verse 7, Now the first lot came out for uh, Jehoiarib, the second for Jediah, the third for Haram, and the fourth for Seorim, and etc., down to 24. So we have 24 groups that are serving on rotation. So, so they weren't required to be there 24-7, 365 days of the year. So these people were on rotation. You had 24 groups. These are priests from either from, from Aaron. Uh, and so the idea is either you served, they're not sure whether you'd serve two weeks at a time or whether you'd serve a month at a time, and this is a two-year rotation. It's not completely sure. But the point is you're going to serve for a period of time, and then you're no longer required, uh, your service is no longer required. In chapter 25, verse 1, we, again, we have David's worship team, and there is a change. Verse 1, Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals, and the number of those who performed the service was, etc. So we have Asaph, we have um, Heman, and Ethan's not listed anymore. So Ethan, apparently, perhaps he died. Perhaps he's no longer involved. But now you have somebody named Jeduthun that's put in place. And we see that Jeduthun actually wrote Psalms as well. He wrote Psalms, Psalm 39, 62, and 77. So he definitely was a heavy hitter, just like Ethan was. And uh, he also wrote Psalms. In chapter 25, verse, verse 8, we see they cast lots for their duties all alike, the small as well as the great, the teacher as well as the pupil. Now the first lot came out for, a for Asaph to Joseph, the second to Gedaliah, he and his relatives, and his sons were 12. And you keep going, and there's 24 divisions again. So the singers, there's 288 singers. So if you divide them group by group, that leaves 12 singers with each group, and they also were on rotation. So you wouldn't have the same singers there every week. You'd have people that would be rotating as well. Chapter 26 lists other responsibilities. We see gatekeepers. Um, so if you look at 26, verse 14, um, so this is about the gatekeepers. A lot to the east fell to Shelemiah. Then they cast lots for his son Zechariah, a counselor with insight, and his lot came out for the north. So here they're, they're putting together gatekeepers, and it's not just like you're a gatekeeper. 
you open and close the door and you watch people come in. There's, there's more to it than that. In this case, this individual here was a counselor. So what we find here in our church too, is there anyone who just says one thing? Hardly at all, right? I mean, everybody here, I look around, I see so much talent and ability. I mean, everybody's doing multiple things you know, that, that are in the church. And so it's not just one thing, but in this case, they were assigned to be gatekeepers, so that was their primary function. But just like here, we might be doing other things as well. It's not just restricted to one thing. Um, so other responsibilities included keepers of the treasury, uh, judges, overseers. We have our own treasurer here, Dave. Uh, we <laughs> judges, I mean, we wouldn't call them judges, but the, uh, the elders are people who keep things under control. They're reviewing things all the time. Um, uh, so we have people that kind of fill those functions from the perspective of the church. And then chapter 27, we do have the army also was divided up into uh, groups. In chapter uh, 27, verse 1, <clears throat> now this is the enumeration of the sons of Israel, the heads of the father's households, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and their officers who served the king in all the affairs of the divisions which came in and went out month by month throughout all the months of the year, each division numbering 24,000. So you had, you had 12 divisions here. So you see each group of soldiers is going to serve for a month at a time. And they numbered 24,000. Uh, so these 24,000 that are in Jerusalem, what responsibilities might these 24,000 uh, fulfill while they're there? Some things that they would do, ancient soldiering, as it were. Protecting what? Protect and serve? Yeah, yeah. With their black and white chariots. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is right, though, because they didn't have a police force back in those days. And so the, the army would often take up many of the responsibilities of the arm, or, uh, police. Go ahead, Daniel. Some sort of what? Yeah, there's a dispute an issue going on, they're going to be the ones that are going to be dispatched to handle it, as it were. Plus, now, anywhere that was serving David, there would be an outpost there. So there's an outpost in Ammon, there's an outpost in Moab, there's an outpost over here. And these soldiers, some of them, would have been required to man the outposts. And that's where they're going to bring tribute and that kind of thing. So you'd have this ongoing rotation. So, uh, and yet, at the same time, this standing army is 288,000 men, you could bring them all together if you have a national emergency, if you have a threat from outside or whatnot. So, but you always have these 24,000 that are available and at the king's right hand, as it were. Um, in chapter 27, we continue on. There's other responsibilities listed that David had for people. We had, have chief officers for each tribe, overseers for agriculture, olive oil, livestock, David's personal uh, personal property and counselors are mentioned in chapter 27, including Ahithophel, who's mentioned, who winds up becoming a, a bad guy when Absalom tries to overthrow the kingdom. So David, we see, we see that his kingdom was highly organized. And, you know, you read the scripture that God is a God of order. He wants things to be done decently and in order. And even in church, we have order. We have uh, we have things put together a certain way, and, and uh, not that we can't change it, but for the most part, we have it established as well. So then we see in chapter 28, the next couple of chapters are David's final preparation for the temple. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the commanders of the divisions that served the king, and the commanders of thousands, and the commanders of hundreds, and the overseers of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, with the officials and the mighty men, even all the valiant men. Then King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brethren and my people. I had intended to build a permanent home for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God. So I made preparations to build it. But God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you are a man of war and have shed blood. So we see that what David's wish was in God's redirection. 
David, I love the fact that you want to build me a house, and I'm going to build you a house, because we know that, that God established a dynasty for David that was going to end with whom? Jesus, exactly right. Jesus was going to be the final fulfillment because the Davidic dynasty would never end. So, so God built David a house, as it were, and he said, your son is going to build that house instead of you. In verse 11 of 28, we see, then David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch of the temple, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat. And it goes on. So when Solomon built the temple, it wasn't exclusively Solomon's design. I kind of used to think that way, that Solomon came. No, David had the design already done. I'm not saying that Solomon might not have adapted it or maybe changed it a bit. We have no way of knowing. But, But David gave to him all the plans that he had already drawn out because he's the one that wanted to do it. Um... In chapter 29, we see more of David's careful and extensive preparation. Then David said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now with all my ability, I have provided for the house of my God the gold for all the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, inlaid stones, stones of antimony, and stones of various colors, and all kinds of precious stones and alabaster abundance. Uh, If you continue on, you'll see that that David had given 3,000 talents of gold, 7,000 talents of silver. Do you remember how much weight... How much English weight is in a talent? Does anyone remember? It's uh, 75 pounds. So you have 75 pounds of gold. How many ounces of gold would that be? Glad you asked. 1,200 ounces. (laughs) At today's value, one talent of gold would be worth $2.4 million. And David gave 3,000 of these. So that's Fort Knox, probably. I mean... And also 7,000 7, uh, talents of silver. Again, same thing, uh, 1,200 ounces. Now, it's not worth as much. It's only $50 an ounce. It's actually not even that much. But, so it's a lot less. But think about the money that went into this, this uh, preparation for this building. Not only that, <clears throat> but uh, when, when, the, when Herod's temple was destroyed in 70 AD, 68 AD, 70 AD, um, even, even with that, there was, so much, there was so much gold and so much jewelry and so much riches that when Titus destroyed that, they took all of that, all the riches, and they built a Colosseum with in Rome. So the Colosseum that's built in Rome is built with the funds that they got, the spoil from destroying uh, Herod's temple back in 70 AD. Just to give you an idea of how much money that the temple uh, garnered even, even after Solomon. In chapter 29, it continues in verse 6. Then the rulers of the father's households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with the overseers over the king's work offered willingly and for the service for the house of God they give 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, and 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of brass, 100,000 talents of iron. And it goes on to say that uh, precious stones, etc. So David had given an astronomical amount. Well, the people were encouraged, and they gave even more. So you have the people getting together. So the temple is really the people's temple. You know, they contributed to the construction of it uh, from the grassroots on up. In chapter 29, 22, we see that Solomon, they made Solomon the son of David king a second time, and they anointed him as ruler for the Lord and Zadak as priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father, and he prospered and all Israel obeyed him. So we see that Solomon is placed on the throne. He actually is placed on the throne before David died. 
This had to be done because his, one of his other sons was trying to make himself king. And so uh, Bathsheba and I believe Nathan the prophet came in and formed David, etc. And so David put Solomon, installed him as king while he was still alive. So there'd be no question about whom he wanted to be king, which is really a big deal. And that also prevented civil war. And then we see in chapter 29, verse 28, that David finally dies. He died at a ripe old age, full of days, riches, and honor, and his son Solomon reigned in his place. Interesting, David was a man of war, and yet David died a peaceful death. He died of old age. Well, probably all, if not most, if not all of his enemies died a violent death. Bill, go ahead. Right. Well, you're almost at a ripe old age. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> Right. Right. Okay. Good. Any other thoughts? Any other? <laughs> Steve. True. Right. Right. Yes, that's true. Dennis. Right, right, that's true. Matthew. Oh, that's a good point too. The ripe old age based on context with what he went through. Yeah, to live to be 70 and live that kind of warfare type of life, that is pretty remarkable. Peggy. <clears throat> I'll, I'll get you, Dave. <laughs> that is true. I got to remember that excuse, that, that truism. Dave. Yeah. Oh, yes. You're right. Right. It's, I'm looking at it from the perspective of organization, but you're saying this is exactly the fulfillment of what Samuel said he would do. Yeah, absolutely. Big time. Exactly. And Solomon just made it worse. Right. Yes. Good. Any other thoughts? Okay, how about takeaways from this particular segment? Anything that you can think about that 
besides the fact that ripe old age is actually about 70. Other than that, <laughs> any other takeaways? A couple of things that I noticed myself is that God has a job, a responsibility in the church for each one of us. God has something that he wants us to do, maybe more than one thing. And he doesn't just stick us in one hole sometimes. Sometimes he has us do more things than one. Also, God delights in our desire to honor and serve him. David wanted to build a temple. God said, no, you can't do it. But he honored David in that he even wanted to do that and gave him a blessing because of it. And also that God is a God of order. He expects things to be done orderly as well. All right, let's go ahead. Steve, you're going to say something? Okay, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the things that are written. <clears throat> and again, just as we demonstrate here in class, we can take that diamond and turn it. We can look at it from a different perspective, a different idea, and it's still your word. And your word teaches us multiple things, Lord. Thank you so much for First Chronicles. We thank you, Lord, for this information about David, about what he did in his kingdom, uh, the organization, etc. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you help us to realize that you do have things you want us to do, to be responsible for, and that you are indeed a God of order. I pray, Lord, that you would be with, with Matthew and the worship team today. Lord, may you uh, use them to open our hearts for worship to you, uh, to hear your word, and with Pastor as he preaches, again, with, with, with power, with passion and zeal, that we would grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen.